So we're going to look at the overcurrent protection devices that will be covered on our course and in our coursework material. We're going to look at the rewirable fuse, the BS3036, semi-enclosed rewirable fuse. We're going to look at the BS1361 um, cartridge fuse. We're going to look at the BSEN60898 circuit breaker in this presentation, along with the high rupturing capacity BS88. So first we'll have a look at this semi-enclosed rewirable fuse, uh, BS3036. Um, often taken out now in domestic dwellings, uh, distribution boards are being changed, uh, upgraded from plastic to metal, and the overcurrent protection devices are often also upgraded to circuit breakers. But they can still be installed, and they can still be widely found in commercial and industrial installations. These rewirable fuses, BS3036 semi-enclosed fuses, all come with a very similar design. So I'll pull out a 5 amp rewirable fuse. Okay, denoted by colour white as well. We're going to get to that in part of the presentation as well. It looks very similar in construction to the 30 amp rewirable fuse, except when you turn them over, you can see the brass pins on the 5 amps are considerably smaller than those of the 30 amp design. This causes some issues because people tend to, when rewiring these fuses, go for the first fuse element they find. So if the line circuit is disconnected or the socket circuit is disconnected, whichever fuse wire is found in the cupboard tends to be the one that's reinserted uh, into the actual rewirable fuse itself. So as we turn it over, you can see a fuse element is attached between the two brass pins, in this case, rate of five amps. But if the customer was desperate to get the lights back on, are they paying that much attention when they get the fuse wire element out of the cupboard and this one rated at 15 looks very similar if they were to place it between the two brass pins by inserting it through and attaching it to the two screws the lighting circuit's likely to come back on as long as the fault's been cleared therefore the customer's happy the problem being now we've got potentially a lighting circuit fuse not at 5 amps and a considerably higher in this case this would be 15 therefore we're running the risk of shock fire and explosions in the installation and you look at the pins you can see that one is designed to carry considerably more current than the other so the actual construction is not designed to carry any more than the rated value of it in this case being five amps some other considerations for a rewirable fuse is the fact that the fuse element is open to the air therefore liable to deteriorate also because it's not enclosed completely when it's carrying too much current or an overcurrent or a short circuit current obviously the fuse element itself is going to get very hot the heat's going to cause the element to break obviously through melting because some of the heat can escape that means it's not uh, the most precise device that you could get. They have fusing factors, all the devices we're going to look at, and the fusing factor for rewirable fuses, in this case a 5 amp one, all the rewirable fuses have a fusing factor of 2. That means it will take twice the current, in this case 10 amps, in order to cause operation of the device. Because of this poor fusing factor, when we later in our course notes looking at designing circuits and perhaps the designer for some reason has chosen to use a rewirable fuse or the circuit has been extended which is protected by a rewirable fuse, we must take into consideration a correction factor for using this type of device of 0 0.725. We'll come up with that in a later set of notes in the classroom. One of the early take-home tasks I'll be setting my learners at my college is to look at their distribution board, look at their earthing arrangement as well, take some photographs. Earthing arrangements are covered in two of my other presentations, looking at TNS and TNCS earthing arrangements. I would also expect my students to be looking at their distribution board or distribution boards of friends. I'd like to think that we could find a distribution board that had an older style overcurrent protection devices, whether they be rewirable fuses or cartridge fuses, using the colour scheme. So we've got a white carrier white dotted fuse for five amps. We've got blue for 15, we've got yellow to represent 20, and finally we've got red to represent 30. And they're the sort of things that we need to start looking at and noting in the real world. We're also going to need to know the prospective short circuit braking capacity. In other words, the amount of current and default conditions that the device can handle and clear and not cause, for instance, the fuse wire element to melt, remelt across, actually not disconnecting the circuit, but re-solidify and obviously become a, a fuse element that's still connected between the pins. The rewirable fuse can withstand anywhere between 1 and 4,000 amps under fault conditions. One of my previous presentations looks at PFC uh, measuring at an installation. However, you need to know the S1A, S2A and S4A of the actual fuse wire element itself. One being for 1,000 amps, two being for 2,000 amps and four being for 4,000 amps that it can clear under short circuit faults. 
However, even on the fuse wire element itself, I cannot find S1A, etc. So you always have to presume the lowest rated. So in other words, a thousand amps. These can only clear faults up to a thousand amps. And when you're testing for PFC, you need to confirm that the prospective short circuit current won't exceed a thousand amps, as these devices will fail in that part of the installation. To many of the negatives to go with rewirable fuses, there must be some advantages. Uh, they used to be very cheap, uh, now they're not because nobody uses them, so they're more expensive to buy than circuit breakers. So that's a, an old uh, cliche exam question when the advantage of using a rewirable fuse is that it's inexpensive. That's not the case anymore. I would suggest probably the only advantage is it doesn't have any moving parts. Therefore, not having a moving part doesn't need to be functional tested. Also, not having a moving parts, that they can't fail. So the mechanism within it cannot fail because there is not one. So I'd suggest the exam might say that they're cheap, I suggest their only advantage is there's no moving parts, therefore they cannot fail. Go on and look at the BS1361 cartridge fuse. Uh, physically looks very similar to the BS1362 plug top fuse. Okay, so not to get confused with the two. So these are BS1361s. We've got the same color carrier bases. So if this got a red carrier base here, it would have a 30 amp BS1361 cartridge fuse attached to it. And we've got the white base being a five amp. When we physically open up, a 5 amp BS1361 fuse, you can see it almost looks like a plug top fuse in construction. Same design, two metal end caps, a ceramic or glass body. Okay, this one having a glass body, this one having a ceramic body. And the fuse wire element is encased between the end caps. So it's still a piece of copper wire as before, but this time because it's encased within the actual physical enclosure, obviously when it generates heat under fault conditions, the heat is with, uh, withheld within the actual vessel itself, causing the fuse wire element to, to melt a lot, a lot quicker than in a rewirable fuse. It's a more accurate device, therefore it doesn't have a fusing factor of two, which was attributed to the rewirable fuse. It has a fusing factor of less than 1.5. So in other words, a 5 amp uh, cartridge fuse BS1361 will take 7.5 amps in order to operate. When these are used domestically, they cannot be interchanged. So if that one being a five amp one and we've got a 20 amp one here, we can see physically the 20 amp is bigger. So customers, when they're replacing these, can only really physically replace it with the correct physical type of BS1361 because it wouldn't go between the actual pins themselves. The only problem is what tends to happen is people tend to bridge between the two with a piece of fuse wire when these have actually operated because they're likely to have more chance of having these kicking around in a are covered at home than they are replacement fuses. Replacement fuses can be quite expensive. We may be talking six pounds to replace a 20 amp fuse, BS1361, where the fuse wire element would be attached between the two. Circuit comes back on, customer's happy, and we're back down the risk of massive shock, fire, and explosions within the installation. To summarize the BS1361, then comparing it to a rewirable fuse, it's a more accurate device with a 1.5 fusing factor or less. We know that the element itself is encased in a glass or ceramic body with two metal end caps, meaning that the element is not liable to deteriorate. We know that the elements um, and bodies need to be replaced correctly. They're physically different sizes as we move through the amp ratings and that customers can be uh, have a tendency to replace a wire across them in order to get their circuits back on. We know that this is obviously unacceptable creating a massive risk of shock, fire and explosions and one thing electricians should be looking out for when they're out there in industry. But overall, the device should not be shunned, it can be installed for brand new circuits and in commercial industrial installations, the cartridge fuse will be a common overcurrent protection device. So looking at the BSEN 60898 circuit breaker, we tend to have a love affair with these in the electrical industry, uh, many advantages to use them, one or two disadvantages. Okay, so the circuit breakers themselves run slightly different amp ratings, so we don't have a 5, we have a 6, 16, 20 and 32, very similar to what we saw before with the 5, 15, 20 and 30 for all other devices. We also have now a letter coding against the circuit breaker, these being in this case B6, 16s, B20 and B32, so they're all B type circuit breakers. We can also have C type circuit breakers and D type circuit breakers. We'll go into some detail in the course about you know, the design and selecting either B's, C's or D's, but just quickly, domestically you'd have a B type circuit breaker where there's lots of inductive loads such as a commercial office with a fluorescent light fittings, you'd probably have a C type circuit breaker where you have highly inductive loads like welding equipment, some air conditioning units, you'd have a D type circuit breaker. 
We'll add a little bit more detail as we move through the course on those. Circuit breakers also have a fusing factor of 1.5 or less. Manufacturers will tell you exactly the fusing factor for those. So a more precise device than the rewirable fuse seen in the first section. Characteristics of the fuse have been set by the manufacturer and we cannot tamper with these in any way. So in other words, it's a sealed unit, meaning that once it's operated, the device will go into the off position, find the fault has been cleared, we should be able to reset that. We will look at in a set of notes about the prospective fault current that these can clear and clear safely. There is a case that sometimes if it's a massive fault current that these have had to clear, that the actual device would need to be replaced. That's something that industry teams to ignore, the fact that they always believe that a circuit breaker can be just reset. There is an instance where they need to be replaced because of the amount of fault current they have cleared. We'll cover that in a set of notes in the classroom. A circuit breaker has physical moving parts, therefore requires to be functionally tested. So in other words, you must turn your breaker from the on position to the off, see the circuit go off and re-energize it to prove functionality. In other words, it actually turns on and off. We've got a clear sided circuit breaker here and we can see two other features that we'll discuss in the classroom. It has a bimetal strip and a coil here. And we've seen in previous studies in the classroom that a conductor carrying current will create a magnetic field around it. If we put that into a coil, okay, we increase the strength of the magnetic field and we use both the bimetal strip and the fact that a conductor will create a magnetic field within the basic principles of a circuit breaker. When you overload this circuit breaker, in other words, ask it to carry more current than it's designed to do so, it's rated for this one at 20 amps. Fusing factor would be 1.5 times that, so roughly 30 amps but we're looking at the bimetal strip at the top here. When we ask it to carry more than its 20 amps, starts to get warm. That bimetal strip eventually over time will cause the disconnection of the circuit. Where there's a short circuit of negligible impedance or an earth fault in circuit, the massive current creates a massive magnetic field here. So the circuit breaker could be carrying hundreds or thousands of amps for a small duration, creates a massive magnetic field, causing the mechanism to operate. So you've got two ways in which it operates. Overload through the bimetal strip and the magnetic field created around this coil creates such a strong magnetic field, it pulls the mechanism. Yeah, the Rolls-Royce of fuses really. Now we're looking at the high rupturing capacity uh, BS88 fuses. Okay, these are generally the ones that would be in the mains incoming position of a large installation. They are highly robust, so physically you couldn't damage that fuse, very strong fuse. Also, it's very good at distinguishing between short-term inrush currents uh, by turning on inductive loads and distinguishing that between actual fault currents and therefore causing operation. The fuse wire elements built in here are often made of silver, Okay, and often of a construction or design, not straight through, but of a either perforated or shaped fuse element. So not just a straight fuse wire going through, but a clever design um, on construction, meaning that it is a very precise device. It's often filled with a quartz filler or silica sand in there, again, for when the actual fault occurs, the actual temperature is held around it, making it a more precise device. The heat isn't allowed to escape. The, the quartz filler or silica sand helps uh, be a more precise device. Uh, not really much disadvantage of using a um, BS88 fuse, perhaps the expense of them, you know, they can be vastly expensive because of the, the Rolls-Royce style design that they've got. So that's our first look at the four overcurrent protection devices covered on our course. There's more information to add in other video presentations. There'll be all more information to be added in the classroom. But that gets us underway and that starts the journey on our overcurrent protection devices.